in the 1700s and the 1600s as well too. Uh, this time period in European history we oftentimes call the Ancient Regime. This is going to be a, more of a reference to pre-French Revolution France, but uh, many of the same situations apply to the rest of Europe as they do to France. So this is going to be a concept that we kind of interchangeably toss out there for this entire period pre-French uh, Revolution. Where does this begin? Well, this is going to begin with the realization that life in Europe is not extraordinarily great for the average human being. Uh, as governments became more centralized, as we saw the creation of the constitutional monarchy in England and Louis XIV's autocratic state in France, Peter the Great's state in Russia, reality is, is the more rights that a king takes, the more authority that they take, the less rights an average individual in Europe is going to have. And in fact, in most areas of Europe, what we see is not an individual understanding of rights, but a communal understanding of rights. Maybe in a small area, a community has a, uh, a right to decide what religion they have within those borders or that community, not an individual on a case-by-case -case basis. We also see that, except for the reality of Russia and the whole table of ranks, the ability to move between social classes from nobility to peasantry and from peasantry to nobility is pretty much non-existent. You really can't move, uh, with a few exceptions such as Russia. So reality is we have a very split system in Europe, and this is what's going to characterize our society that's taking place in the early forms of the Enlightenment. So what does this look like for day-to-day -day life? Well, one thing we haven't really talked about much in this class is really dichotomy that exists between continental Europe and just outside continental Europe and the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire during this time period is relatively prosperous. Uh, in fact, in many ways, shapes, and forms, they are going to be a much more progressive society than what we have in Europe. In the Ottoman Empire, you have opportunities to gain more elite status through military service. We have religious toleration of what they call peoples of the book, so Christians, Jews, and Muslims. And we have a society that's just significantly more progressive and basic understandings of individual rights than what we see in Europe. In Europe, what we have is an extraordinarily persistent nobility that refuses to give up any of its authority. In fact, they will find ways to either gain new authority, leniences, or rights at the expense of the peasantry whenever possible. We also see the fact that the church is still extraordinarily interwoven in the actual day-to-day -day life of an individual in Europe. Uh, we still see the Catholic Church influencing how people believe. We still see priests kind of dictating this whole idea of whether we have superstition versus doctrine that... We talk about when we talk about religion, the Enlightenment, and reality, uh, even in England and in France and Italy, the Pope and or head of the church in England are just going to be significant political figures still. They have not really dismissed that notion yet in either nation or either reality of you know Anglicanism or Catholicism. Economically, Europe is built off of a guild system. And this is a very simple system that has been running since the Middle Ages, uh, one that really does not provide much for social mobility. So let's take an example of a blacksmith. A blacksmith, you have a master blacksmith who is the person who's typically doing the majority of the work in the shop. You may have an apprentice in this shop who will spend 10 to 20 years of their life trying to learn the trade of the blacksmith from their master. Upon completion, they are then declared a master and able to give or create their own shop themselves. Well, because it takes 10 to 20 years to do this, we see very few people ever having an opportunity to really take on the trade skills that are characteristic of a middle class. So we don't really have one that exists in Europe at the time. Except for merchants in some places like Italy, uh, England, and then the Netherlands. And then lastly, we have a very characteristic poor rural peasantry. Uh, peasants are going to be overwhelmingly bogged down by taxes, various different ones that we'll talk about in a second, such as corvées and robots. And this is going to really prevent the, the peasantry from ever really making any economic gains in their nations. And this is just life in the old world. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this down to two different pieces here. First, we're going to talk about the nobility, then we're going to talk about the peasantry. Uh, the nobility itself is characteristic through a variety of different dichotomies. We're going to look at how the nobility differences in stuff that exists in one nation versus the next versus a kind of collective Eastern European approach to nobility. But let's talk about the basic aspects of nobility.
18th century Europe is built on a strong aristocracy. The nobility is the key feature of any successful nation in Europe at the time. The nobility is going to make up your government advisors. They're going to make your, your high church officials. Uh, despite the fact that the Reformation was designed to prevent just the handing of church roles to the wealthy, we still see a significant chunk of them being church officials because they are the only ones who are predominantly still educated. Now, they may be qualified because they are educated, but they're still coming from wealthy elite families. Then, of course, our military generals, our leaders, are oftentimes going to be of the aristocracy as well because, again, they're going to be educated, whereas the average peasant is not. There are also certain privileges that are going to come with being a member of the nobility, and this will vary across Europe. But typically, you look at some sort of uh, free taxation and extrajudicial rights, which we'll explain in a second. In Britain, we have a very specific type of nobility that takes place. Uh, we have a defined nobility. It is going to be explicitly 400 families, and these 400 families are all voting members in the Parliamentary House of Lords. This is going to allow them to have a significant influence over the government. And it also means that it's not going to be something where you can immediately join the House of Lords. The title of nobility in Britain is extraordinarily hard to get a hold of because with the title of nobility must come land ownership. If you do not own land in England, you cannot be a lord. And from the very realistic fact that England is a relatively small nation and there is a finite amount of land, this makes it very hard for anyone to ever move into the nobility in England. From a practical aspect, the nobility in England are going to be the responsible caretakers of the government themselves. They're the ones who will collect taxes. They're going to be the ones who administer laws. They're going to be the day-to-day -day interaction the average peasant has with the British government. In France, we're going to see things a bit different. In France, we're not going to have the very confined nobility that we have in England. In fact, in France, we have up to 400,000 nobles in the nation. Because there were different routes to nobility. We have two different groups that will exist in France. We have what they call nobles by the sword, who are members of the nobility that gain their titles of nobility through military service. The other notion is nobles of the robe. You can be a noble of the robe through one of two methods. One, you do some sort of particular favor for the king, or you are an old traditional noble family. These would be your your Bourbons, your Geese families, these, these long traditional families that existed for generation and generation in France. Or you can buy a title. If you buy a title in France, you become a noble. And that's what's going to allow a lot of people to become nobles, but still, this is extraordinarily expensive. And even if you do buy a title of nobility in France, it doesn't guarantee your success as a noble. In fact, once you were created as a noble, you then had another division that took place amongst the nobility. Whether or not you are welcome to Versailles, and given that invitation to Versailles, will determine whether or not you are considered a preferred noble or a second noble. If you are a preferred noble, you receive that invitation, you spend the rest of your life at Versailles. If you don't, you are considered a noble, but not like really an important noble. You're kind of just like, whatever, it's just a noble, no big deal. Well, this complicated system that exists and how it's so lavish and yet at the same time restrictive, but not restrictive in really the right defined ways, is going to engender a lot of animosity amongst the nobility in France by the peasantry. They see the nobility, or at least the institution of aristocracy, as a joke. In England, it is very clear-cut. These are your noble families. They serve a purpose. They carry out the government. And that, that aspect of the uniformity of the nobility helps the British people become a little bit more used to the notion of it. And because they have a parliament where they have a house of commons and the people do get an actual say in things there, they're willing to accept the existence of the nobility. In France, none of that takes place, and we see resentment built up. In the rest of Europe, we have a lot of different understandings of how this works. We will see uniform taxes played throughout a lot of this, and one of these most explicit uniform taxes is something called the corvée, forcing the peasantry to pay for public works. These corvées are going to be effectively work taken out of the lives of the, pub, uh, the general masses, the public, the peasantry. 
And you can see from this illustration here, there's the general animosity that people have for the, the aristocracy. It's called la hydre aristocratique. Wow, cannot speak French. And you can see how it's the general public, the masses are attacking this, this demonic monster that is attacking their rights, their understanding. And once you kill one head, another one is there. It's just this horrible being that exists. And this is the symbolic of the, the way the French people react to the aristocracy. Well, outside of France, we have a lot of different understandings of what this will look like. In Poland, we have an aristocracy that's completely exempt from taxes. In Austria, the aristocracy is almost exempt from taxes, but also serves as judges in your trials. So if you have a grievance with another president or a lord, it's that lord who gets to determine whether or not you're guilty or innocent, which clearly is going to lead to an imbalance in the system. In Prussia, the Junkers, as they are called, are the, the aristocracy that exists there. And because of Frederick the Great's need for them, they're going to have an elevated role in Prussian society. Our one somewhat counterpoint is Russia, and you've already learned about Peter the Great and his table of ranks, where he created an aristocracy based on merit as opposed to natural birth. Well, once people gained that aristocracy, they didn't want to give it up, and they'll institute something called the Charter of the Nobility, guaranteeing their own rights and privileges above that of the average human being. And this is just the reality that exists if you're an aristocracy Democratic person in Europe, you, just, you view yourself as better people because life for the average person is just different. A noble has all of the important jobs in this society. A noble has all of the ability to use the government. You have the money. The average person doesn't have any of these things in your repertoire to be able to use, and therefore you don't really have a voice in how society runs. You just have taxes upon taxes upon taxes. So briefly, let's look at the peasant life, because it's a lot simpler, and therefore it doesn't take as much time to learn. If you are a peasant, your life is built around taxes. If you, it's a corvée, your tax is that there is time in the day that you have to spend working on a noble's lord. A banality is that of the land that you produce, you have to give up some of that, some of the crops that you grow from there to feed the noble beyond that. So now you're even cutting into what little land you have, what little crops you produce, and you have to give some of that away. And then you also have forced labor in the form of a robot that's done throughout Eastern Europe, where you are now forced to work in other capacities for a noble as well, too. As you can see, this is not exactly a well, great life, and odds are the peasants are going to revolt, and they do. And we see peasant revolts break out throughout Europe. In Russia, and this is one of the most ridiculous notions that ever existed, Wealth is counted not by land, but the number of souls to which you had control. Not by land, but the souls over which you had control. That really kind of sums it up for you, the situation that exists between the nobles and the peasantry in Russia. And we see mass revolutions break out. Various revolts, peasant revolts, uh, so it's, such as Pugachev's rebellion, where the peasants will go up and attempt to wipe out the nobility that overthrow them or kind of overrule them, and instead Pugachev gets burned at the stake, clearly not resolving the issues. Reality is you don't live in a home like this. You live in a home like this, and it's usually 10 to 20 people. The reality is that the family is the central unit because it's the only thing you could rely upon. Whereas in Western Europe, we see small families, five to six people, very commonplace to what we understand today in the United States. In Eastern Europe, we see families of up to 20 people, your extended families, mom, grandpa, your cousins, your aunt, your uncles, everyone is involved. And this is because the family is so vitally important to just survival. And smaller families, if you have jobs in the city and things like that, you can survive off of those. Where cities didn't exist in Eastern Europe, you were reliant exclusively upon farm labor. And the more children, the more people you have working at the farm, the better off your family is. So it's not exactly a great system. Not exactly one that makes you happy and loving every other household that you have. And so with this, we wrap up the notion of society and the Enlightenment. I will talk to you guys later, and have a wonderful day.